All right, so we're going to get started today. Um, good news for everybody is next week's spring break. So you get the week off, and better yet, I get the week off, so that's good. Um, it comes actually pretty close to halfway in the semester this time, so that's, that's pretty good. So when you get back, you got about halfway to go. Uh, I have current grade sheets as of yesterday evening, so everything's been graded that you've posted so far, so that's a good sign. So you guys will all get that. Uh, I'll hand that back today. So you can see where you are at the 50% mark. Um, currently, there's 50% of the grade is in, so you can see right where you stand. Um, so it's pretty good. 50% of the semester, 50% uh, of your grade. So we're going to start today talking about color theory. And I'll begin this discussion by saying, when I talk about color theory today, I'll probably make it seem like it's m way bigger deal than it actually is. Um, not every decision possible out there has to do with color theory. People don't sit around and think about, oh, well, I want to you know, incite violence, therefore I'm going to use red as my color. I mean, it, that's not how it works all the time. But I try to overemphasize these concepts so that you see that color theory does actually play a role in graphic design uh, or in design in general. So just because I talk about red being analogous to anger or, or that sort of thing doesn't mean that you shouldn't ever use red or you shouldn't ever wear red. It's still something that um, you know, can be used. So just take everything that I say today with a little bit of a grain of, a grain of salt. So we'll start first. Um, this is going back to the, you, know, you were in kindergarten class, and you got out the finger paints, and you mixed the finger paints together, and you made various colors. We're going to start at that level and work our way through. So first, we've got our color wheel with our primary colors, our red, our yellow, and our blue colors. Those are um, relatively opposite each other on the color wheel. They're at the three positions. There's our red, there's our yellow, and there's our blue. So those are our primary colors. They each are designated on this particular color wheel, not that you can see my mark because it's red, uh, with the P's like that. The secondary colors are halfway in between. So if we take yellow and we take red and we pick halfway in between, we get our secondary color, which is orange. Same thing. If you were back in kindergarten and you took those finger paints out and you started mixing the red paint and the yellow paint, you get orange. My guess is you guys are all very familiar with this, and this is, this is not new news for you. Tertiary colors are the middle colors. So you take a primary color and you mix it with a secondary color, and you get the tertiary color, the third level color. And obviously, this could continue uh, more and more divisions. Complementary colors are colors that are opposite of each other on the color wheel. So if we pick a color, say orange, its complement is directly across on the color wheel. So the complement of orange would be blue. This is easy color theory. You're looking for an accent color. You go to the complement. Chances are it's going to work nicely as an accent color. It's going to complement uh, the color that you chose as your primary color. Analogous colors are groups of colors that are similar on the color wheel. They're subtle variations in colors. This, uh, when I talked about the logos last class, I was showing you that that was one of the logo trends, were these analogous colors, several colors similar to each other, uh, positioned next to each other. Uh, and so they match well, but they don't provide a lot of highlight. They go together well. That's the nature of an analogous set of colors. So color systems, and I think this is one of the harder things for me to try to explain uh, for you guys because I don't have a good illustration of how it works. But essentially, we have two color systems that make up the world of color. We have an RGB system, and we have a CMYK system. And they work differently. The RGB system is a light-based system. So if we shine lights and mix that colors, those colors together, we end up getting different results. So in this system, the RGB system, if we had a red light and we had a green light, where those two lights overlap, they would become yellow. So I don't know if you guys have been to the Exploratorium in San Francisco, but they used to have a great exhibit on this with these various colored lights um, where you could walk in front and your shadow would change colors depending on which lights you were blocking. It's a good way of understanding. This is essentially an additive color system. So we add one light to the other, we get a new light. If we add red light, green light, and blue light together, we get white light. So we're adding the colors together. This is primarily um, something that we see on all our screen type devices, our iPads, 
our computer monitors, our TVs, our projectors, those are all additive color systems. They're projecting light. If we were to look really closely at one of our monitors, you could see that it's made up of little tiny red, green, and blue dots. And depending on which red, green, and blue dots are turned on and turned off, we see different colors, different colors of light. So that's an RGB system. So if we're working for something that is intended to be presented using RGB color systems, i.e. on a monitor, on an iPad, on a phone, um, or a television, we want to be working in the RGB color space. If we're working on something that's printed, we're going to be working in a different color space. And that is the CMYK color space. You've probably heard of both of these before. So CMYK is a subtractive color space. And it has to do with how we print things. So this is a printed document. It's no longer light anymore. And it works like this. If we were to print cyan ink on a page, that bluish ink, and we were to overlap it with magenta ink, when those two inks come together, we'd end up with blue. The way that this works is that when you print, let's say, cyan ink on a page, all of the light that hits the page is absorbed except for the color of cyan. That's what's reflected back. That's how we see that cyan blue color. Same thing would happen if we printed yellow ink on the page. It's absorbing all of the different light spectrums except for yellow. Yellow is what gets reflected back. So when we combine yellow and magenta ink on the page, when the, that is reflected back, we get red. So it's a little bit different way of thinking about it. So the CMY is relatively obvious, cyan, magenta, and yellow. The K is called key, which is black. So typically, if you think of toner in a laser printer, that kind of color, you'd have a cyan toner cartridge, you'd have a magenta toner cartridge, and you'd have a yellow toner cartridge as your primary colors, and you'd have a black. So this is very much print form. The things that, you, that come out of a printer, the things that you can handle, your grade sheets that I'm going to give back to you later today, those are all in the CMYK color space. So if your intended purpose of your design work is to be printed, this is the color space that you should be in. So color theory essentially is that there's meaning behind the colors and that those, those meanings bring about a sensory uh, feeling to you as the viewer or as the audience of this particular color. You have an innate feeling about a particular color and that enhances your experience when looking at a piece of art or a drawing or what have you. So you as a designer should be deliberate when thinking about what color, what specific uh, you know, shade of red, shade of yellow are you going to use because that has a particular meaning associated with it. <coughs> so. Color theory is, at its core, about developing aesthetically pleasing color relationships. So we're trying to, to do something with color. Color systems. If we break it into basic emotions, uh, there are specific color groups that are associated with generally emotions. And again, this is one of those things where it's not an absolute science. It's general feelings. We have warm colors, we have cool colors, and we have neutral colors. The warm colors are typically the reds, the yellows, and the oranges. They tend to evoke a feeling of warmth. You could think about a fire or something along those lines, sunshine. Um, that's, that's part of why we get this feeling of warmth. They're often associated with happiness or joy, feelings of excitement. In 2009, struggling websites out there switched their, their primary designs to include yellow to ease customer tensions, to make people happy. It's a subtle sort of thing. And I'm going to show you a bunch of examples a little bit later on so you can see how this actually happens in practice. But these kinds of things can make a difference to a consumer's perception of a particular brand. Cool colors, the blues, the greens, the purples, are generally cold. Think winter, think cold water, those kinds of things. The blues, the, cold, uh, the greens, and the purples. They're often used in professional or clean designs if you want to be stable, um, this is the kind of color that you use. Grays, browns, blacks, whites, these are neutral colors. 
they're not designed to evoke an emotion either way. They're designed to be relatively neutral, and no surprise. Now, of course, if we were looking at the grays, we could have a warm tone gray or a cool tone gray, depending on what we were trying to, to accomplish. Um, so of course, within these, you can have variants. But generally speaking, this category is rather neutral. So let's look at the specific colors. Red. Red is typically symbolic of fire and power. And it's associated with passion or importance. It stimulates energy, maybe excitement over something. The negative connotations of this might be that it's an angry color. It's an aggressive color. Feelings of rage, that sort of thing, are often associated with red. So you think about the positives, but you also think about the negatives associated with a particular color. Orange is associated with happiness, joy, sunshine. Uh, no surprise that it would be there. Um, it evokes childlike exuberance. The negative connotations, it's still a little aggressive. It's not quite as aggressive as a red color, but it's still a little bit on the aggressive side. Um, apparently, it also symbolizes ignorance and deceit. I don't quite get how that is associated, but that's what the color theory book says. So, Yellow is generally the happy color. You know, this is the thing where you, you, I'll use my seven-year-old daughter as an example. She's coloring a picture. What does she do in that upper corner? She gets out the yellow marker, and she draws the half circle with the little rays of sun. It's a happy color, because that's what the sun is. So brightness, energy, optimism, happiness, that's, that's what yellow is about. Um, negative feelings might include caution. Caution tape is yellow. Uh, a while back on campus, they, they came out and they painted around all of the little grates on the ground with yellow. It was hideously ugly when they first did it. And it's kind of softened a bit, so it's not quite so bad. But it's, it's symbolic. We see yellow. We can think of caution. You know, Don't step in there. I actually have an interesting story relating to those grates. This has nothing to do with the color yellow, but why not tell a story? Because it might be, might be slightly more enjoyable, right? So I was in Rome, and uh, I, my girlfriend came over to visit, who ended up being my wife. And uh, we were walking along the street in Rome. And you know, she was trying to be all hip at the time. This is like 2002 or whatever. And we were walking along the street, and she wasn't paying attention to where she was walking. And she took a step, clunk, her first high heel got stuck in one of those grates. And she lost her balance a little bit and stepped forward, clunk, and she managed to get both high heels stuck in one of the grates. So she was permanently stuck on the street uh, in Rome. I had to lift her out. Anyway, not related, but that's why they paint those little yellow things around there for the people that are wearing high heels. So yellow is caution. Green symbolizes nature and has a healing quality. It's associated with growth, harmony, nature. There's a reason that we talk about being green as being energy responsible, because it has to do with nature. So it's kind of interesting that green has become synonymous with being sustainable when it's really just a color. But we think of that and have that association. It's also very symbolic of money. If you go onto a banking website, there's a pretty good chance that they're going to either be green or they're going to be blue. Blue being the stable color, green being about money. So one or the other is, is most often um, there. Uh, negative, it could show greed or jealousy. Um, it can be used to be like a beginner or a lack of experience, somebody new into something. Blue tends to be the peaceful and calming color. It's the very stable color. Uh, it exudes stability and expertise. It's often used for corporation websites. Dell, you know, big companies. Microsoft has a lot of blue in their, in their websites. The White House website, maybe it shouldn't be blue anymore, but it, it, it's blue. Symbolizes trust and dependability. Okay, that's part of this, this whole branding thing. Negative, this might be a little bit on the cold side, passive. OK, so I told you about that White House. This is, an old, this is the old White House website. Okay, So here it is in its normal form, okay, whitehouse.gov. Seems very stable. What if we took the exact same website and we turned it to red? It's an interesting exercise. Same website, same page. We just convert it from the blue to the red. This doesn't seem as stable. It doesn't seem as authoritarian. It's not as, uh, you know, this is just an institution. It's a little different. 
And so this kind of an example shows you that color does matter. What color you end up choosing does matter. Purple, purple is typically the color of royalty or sophistication. Uh, way back when, if you had uh, purple clothes, purple dye was the most expensive dye to get your hands on. So if you had something that was purple, it showed your wealth. Therefore, purple is this color of royalty or wealth. Um, shows wealth or luxury. Often gives a sense of spirituality uh, related to that uh, and encourages creativity associated with healing and or feminine qualities. Negative, it can be a bit on the gloomy side, maybe sad depending on what shade of purple it is. Black, kind of the absence of color, but it tends to be correlated with power or sophistication, elegance, depth. There's a reason that architects like to wear black. Right? It's really funny. You go into your review and you have all these visiting architects come in. Chances are at least 75% of them, maybe more, wear black. You know, Steve Jobs, when he was alive, when he gave all his presentations, he was always in black. There's a certain power associated with wearing black and doing that, uh, that absence of color. And so it's, it's, it's important to pay attention. It's also associated with death. It's the color of mourning. You wear black when somebody dies, that sort of thing. So it does have, it does have some negative connotations. It's the color of grease, grief, mourning, and or sorrow. White is the opposite, purity, innocence. Shows a cleanliness and safety. White can also be a little bit cold and distance. Think like snow, winter, that sort of thing. So research reveals that all human beings make an unconscious judgment about something a person, an environment, or an item within 90 seconds of first viewing it. So you got 90 seconds, that's a minute and a half of viewing something, and that between 62% and 90% of that assessment is based on the color. 90 seconds, color 60 to 90% of that initial judgment about something is based on color. Kind of interesting to think about. That has a lot of power to you as a designer. So let's look at, this, is, this graphic has a bunch of brands that you're all familiar with. We just did the logo uh, lecture. But as we look through these brands, it's kind of interesting to see what different companies have chosen to do. There are some obvious ones. You know, the John Deere logo, for example, being green, makes sense. It's a tractor company. Farming, green, totally makes sense. Whole Foods, makes sense that it would be green. <coughs> Some of the, you know, the, the blue ones are also GE, HP, Dell. Those are all very stable, big companies, no surprise. As we start to move our way out, it's kind of interesting to where, see where people fall. You know, the Coca-Colas, the Netflixes, the Legos, Target are all in the red. Interesting. We move our way out into orange, right? Harley Davidson, a few interesting ones. We move our way out into the yellows. Um, the Nikons, the Shells, the Best Buys, stable, happy color, go out and spend your money on TVs, I guess. And then we get to the, all the way out to the very end where we have the conglomerations of colors. The Microsoft, we, we take everybody. Google, every color. NBC, every color. So it's just interesting to see where people have put the brands. Notice that Apple falls in that kind of gray, black range at the very bottom right there. There's your Apple logo. So it's the opposite of where Microsoft is. Interesting. So let's look at some case studies of color. Here we go. 1996. Anybody not born in 1996? Anybody not alive yet? Amazing. I'm so old, right? So this is 1996. This is like the early, early days of websites. This is like before you can remember websites. I happen to remember this, OK? So this was a big deal. You go to Yahoo, and this was their homepage. Not a lot about color here. The Yahoo logo is red. This is new and exciting. Come to Yahoo. Come do your search at Yahoo. The Yahoo logo is red. And the rest of the page really doesn't have much color on it. A lot of blue because that's the color of a link, not because they made a conscious decision to, to make all of those blue. It's just the color of a link. So let's go forward 
from 1996 to 2000. We jump forward by four years. The Yahoo logo is still red, it's still exciting, this is a new thing. But notice the advent of a lot of, or the, the insert of a lot of green on this particular page. So the year 2000, this was kind of when like you could do online shopping. This is a big deal. I know mean, it seems so bizarre here in 2018 to think about online shopping as like a new thing, right? We're so used to Amazon, yeah, give it to me in two days, right? But in this era, it was like a big deal. Like you could actually order something online. You didn't have to go through a catalog or watch QVC and pick your numbers or whatever it was. This was a, this was a thing. So no surprise, Yahoo's trying to emphasize shopping, spending money. They pull that little bit of a subtle green into their page. Let's go forward, 2003. The first little bit of purple is starting to show up on the Yahoo page. Still very cluttered page, certainly. The Yahoo logo is still red. They're still trying to be an exciting company. Um, it's, it's starting to feel a little cluttered, but we do have a little bit of purple. The personal assistant, I find that one kind of interesting. Right? I wonder what Yahoo personal assistant really meant in 2003. We go forward, 2005. The Yahoo Shopping, this was around Valentine's Day that I pulled this, this particular image. The pink, no surprise, Valentine's Day associated with that color. Um, the Yahoo logo is still red. A Little bit more purple showing up on the page. 2007, Yahoo said, you know what? We wanna be more like Google. Google's really successful. Let's change our page. Let's simplify. Nah, we didn't like that. 2009. 2009 is our first transition from the red Yahoo logo into the purple lo Yahoo logo. So Yahoo made, it's the same logo, but they made the conscious decision to stop being the red, we're new and exciting, because we're not new and exciting anymore, and they started to shift over into the purple colors to try to emphasize, hey, this is a, this is a nice brand, this is a sophisticated, wealthy, high-end brand. I don't know that it was particularly successful, but that was their strategy. Use Yahoo, it's a stable company. We're gonna switch over into the purple color scheme. We move forward, 2013. I couldn't resist the rare sea creature found off the California coast. I just find it funny. Anyway, a uh, little bit darker purple, but a lot more purple on the page. So we're increasing the amount of purple on the page as we go forward. 2016, a little bit more purple. And there's 2017, very much the same as 2016. So that was Yahoo. So let's go back and look at Apple. This is another fun one to look at. So Apple 1997, a lot of red. We're new, we're exciting, come look at us. The old Apple logo with the different colored, the rainbow stripes. Pre-order Mac OS 8. 1998, Apple almost dies, they almost go under, Steve Jobs comes back, complete revamp to the web page. A lot more black introduced. Not the same color anymore. Emphasis on the product itself. Let's go forward to 2000. Interesting. So this, this iMac, I don't know if you guys remember this. This was a big deal when it came out. Uh, it, was, it was the first computer that was actually an object. It was something that was pretty to look at. And I don't know that you could argue that it's pretty anymore, but at the time, Everything else was a beige box. It didn't have any attractiveness to it. This was the first computer that actually looked cool to be able to have something like this. So they had a choice. This computer came in purple and orange and turquoise and I think maybe blue. And so they could choose of those, of those computers which one was gonna go on the homepage. And they picked the purple one to go on the homepage. This is a high-end product this is a wealthy luxury product. Let's show that through the choice of using purple. Conscious decision. We move forward, 2001. A Little bit more blue on the page. Apple logo has switched to blue. Hey, we're back. We're no longer going under. We're a stable company again. Let's show that. Star Wars Episode Two coming out. Adobe Illustrator 10. That's like ancient history. Move forward. The Apple logo switches from blue to gray. 
we're moving in that direction. Still a lot of blue on the page. Holiday gift guide, come buy your stuff. That's in green, no surprise. So this is 2002, check out that laptop. One gigahertz with SuperDrive, yeah baby. 2004, iPod, big deal. Again, iPod is a luxury item, so we're gonna emphasize it by using purple as our color. They had two ad schemes going. One was purple and one was orange. And I don't know whether you guys remember this or not. These were really popular ads with the silhouette. Um, purple showing luxury, orange for the excitement of this new product. We move forward into 2006. No color on the page at all. All black and white. All very, this is a stable. We're here. We make really good products. Move forward into 2007. We're starting to see a little bit of gloss and a little bit of shadow on the page. That was current in the design trends at that point. The iMac comes out. Obviously, they're emphasizing it. A lot of colors on the screens there. 2010. Hard to believe this is what the iPhone looked like in 2010, right? It's come a long way. So there is the iPhone. Notice that the Apple stuff is now that gray color. That's pretty consistent. All the color uh, of these images is on the phones themselves. 2011, a little bit darker gray, but we're still in the gray with the white letters. Again, a little bit darker gray, moving into iPhone 5, 2013. Then in 2013, Johnny Ives got his say, and we switched from the glossy buttons into the flat UI. This is an interesting moment because with iOS 7, uh, at this point, Johnny Ive said, this is the direction Apple's going to go with its design. We're going to eliminate shadows. Everything's going to be a flat UI, color relationships, etc. Nobody else was doing this. No other company was doing it. Everybody was trying to, to, to be all shiny. Johnny Ives did this. iOS 7 rolled out. Every other company followed suit. So they controlled what happened graphically. The UI changed on this date because Apple changed their UI and everybody else followed suit. It's an interesting thing to watch. So we move forward. Interestingly enough, in 2014, they still had a little bit of a shadow on that top bar, a little bit of a shine. I'm surprised that that was allowed to, to stay. Then we move forward in 2015, that shadow's gone. Now we're into the completely flat UI, moving forward. Lots of different colors on the page, but Apple, the Apple bar is that deep, dark gray. Move forward to 2016, it gets a little bit darker. It's a really dark gray, almost black now. And then we get into the really dark, almost entirely black page. Top bar is, is, is black. That's, there you are in 2017. So there's more websites if you're interested in color. Uh, by the way, if you want to look up your own um, old web pages for the fun of it. There's, a, there's an online website, I think it's called the Internet Time Machine. If you Google that, you can go back and look up all these old websites. It's kind of fun to go back and see that. Uh, Palatin is a website that we're going to use today that has to do with color theory. Colored.com is another one. Color lovers are all there. So I promised that we would talk a little bit about Assignment 104 today and get you prepped for it. Actually, part of your exercise today is to research a precedent of Charlie Harper so that you can kind of get the ball rolling and be thinking about it. So we're going to go through a bunch of examples of Charlie Harper's work. Charlie Harper was an artist uh, in the 50s. He did all of these by hand. Illustrator didn't exist, so he had to come up with how to, how to draw this stuff by hand. You guys get the power of Illustrator to create it. But what his drawings were about, fundamentally, he would pick an animal. He would decompose that animal into basic shapes. So we look at this bird. He's breaking it up into some very basic shapes. We have this shape that represents the body. We have a very graphic S curve here that represents the neck. There's a triangle here. And there's that S curve like that. The two beaks are just straight triangles. So it's very abstract. He didn't take a photograph and trace over it. He abstracted it into those basic shapes. And then he carefully composed that onto the page. Notice, by the way, 
I can't help myself. There's a great rule of thirds happening right here. That's where his head is. No surprise. Strong diagonal in this composition. Again, do the birds, do they really look like this? Not at all. It's abstracted into the circle, the arcs, and the square or the rectangle representing the tail. So you're going to be doing something a lot like this in your assignment 104. And I used to have it open-ended. Create your own style Charlie Harper. Just make it up. And I think people struggled with how do you abstract <coughs> these, these birds or whatever into a basic shape. So instead, I'm going to have you today look through Charlie Harper, do a Google search for Charlie Harper images, find some that you like, and then you're going to do your work based on his work. So you're not going to copy it exactly, but you're going to use the same strategy. So in, in, in an example, if you like this particular image, maybe you'd be doing something similar to this, but you'd change the birds. They're no longer cardinals, they're blue jays. I don't know. You'd change it, you'd adapt it, you'd make it your own. And I have some student work that I'll show you a little bit later on. Frequently, when he shows movement, they're done in outlines. So it's the same shape repeated in these hummingbird wings over and over. They're just outlines. And you can see where this lends itself really naturally to Illustrator and the kinds of things we've been doing. Composition is important. The background versus the foreground. So in this case, we have the repetition of the pattern of the circles. One of the circles becomes the bird's head. The two ladybugs, the squirrel. I'm going to just start flipping through these a little bit faster. I think this one is particularly well done because of the layering. So that's the other thing that Charlie Harper doesn't have. There's no perspective to the depth in these images. Everything is flat. So if we look at this particular image, the leaf is on the surface of the water. The rings represent the ripples around the leaf. Below that, we have the lily pads. Below that, we have the fish or the snake. Below that, we have the you know, lobster, crab, crawdad, or whatever it is. So there's multiple layers to the drawing, but they're not three-dimensional. They're still very flat, and that's important to recognize. And there's a picture of Charlie Harper himself. So let's look at some student work. And so you'll see how these start to fall into the same sorts of patterns. Repetition of elements. I think this one's particularly well done. It's clean, simple shapes, but it's very representative and very much in the style of Charlie Harper. I like this one a lot. I think it would be a little bit more successful if the fish was more of a perfect circle. Uh, and also, the gradient on the fish is, is a little bit against Charlie Harper. This one's very, very similar to a Charlie Harper, but it's really nicely done. Another example, this could be one of Charlie Harper's. Very easy. Adaptation of the raccoons, adding in the barbecue. The flamingo and the curving neck, obviously exaggerated, but again, based on simple shapes. I just really like the background of this one. Repetition of elements, uh, but it's really nicely conceived background. OK, so we're going to move over uh, to the other computer. And I'm going to walk you through uh, some of what we're doing today. Why don't we take a, uh, let's take a 13 minute break, come back at 9, and then I'll keep going. Okay? Okay, so we're going to start back up again with exercise 115. Uh, the first part, part under part 1, I'm going to ask you to go find a Charlie Harper image that you think would be a good one to base your work on. So, again, you're not copying it exactly, you're adapting it into your own your own work, so it's not a direct copy. But depending on your skill level in Illustrator, you know, use it as your base. Don't feel like you have to come up with this entirely uh, on its own. 
I want you to find that image. I want you to save that image, and you're going to create a post with that image uh, as your first part of part one. So you're actually going to create two posts today, um, maybe more. But your first one is going to be of this Charlie Harper image, uh, and post a link to the image so we can see where you got it from uh, as well. So that's part one. I'm going to let you do that. I have faith that you're capable of using Google to search for your own Charlie Harper image. I don't think you need me to walk you through that. Um, when we start moving on into color swatches, uh, that's the other half of what I'm going to talk about today. So we, we talked first um, in lecture all about color theory. Uh, the second part of that is when we're working in Photoshop, InDesign, or Illustrator, how do we actually use colors? How do we find a group of colors that we want to use? How do we reuse those colors, uh, et cetera? And we're going to do that using the swatches, which is a way of exchanging colors between the various software programs, but also maintaining a certain color continuity. So uh, you know exactly what color you're using as you go through documents. Let's say that you were working on your logo, and you ended up using a particular color on your logo, and you wanted that same color to show up on your, you know, your stationery and your business card and, and whatever, you would want to know what that color is and how it goes with the other colors. So uh, we're going we're gonna to show you today how to save these colors into a color swatch file that you can then load into uh, any of these programs as we go forward. So the first uh, website that I'm going to use, and I apologize, sometimes in the tutorials and or in these uh, handouts, I mention a website, but then that website goes out of business, so then I shift you to a different website. Um, the first one that we're going to use is a website called Paletton, P-A-L-E-T-T-O-N.com, Paletton.com, which is right here. And I've, went ahead, I've gone ahead and I've, I've loaded it up. And so this is a, a website that helps us figure out how to pick a group of colors. And so across the top here, the, the first option we have is monochromatic for one color. And it starts in red, and you can change the primary color. And you can see as I swing this around, it changes the primary color. Uh, so let's say I wanted a purple color. I can move over into the purples. And it's giving me a primary purple, and then it's giving me some analogous purples, some similar purples, slightly lighter, slightly darker, based on that same tone. I can move this inner group to get further apart from my base color. I can also swing it around to, di to get different results out of it. So it's still all within the same color group. If I move over to this next one, adjacent colors, this is kind of like analogous colors, where I have a primary color, let's say it's red, and I have adjacent colors of kind of pink and kind of orange. So it's giving me red with four extra tones around the red, <coughs> and then this kind of goldish color with four tones around the gold color, the, the maroon with four tones around the gold, and this one here is the repeat of the red. So in this case, it's giving me 15 total swatches that work together. Um, the, the, these colors, the primaries, this red, this gold, and this purple are all in the same kind of shade level. They're all in the same relative darkness. If we moved up to the darker one, this would match up with that darker one, which would match up with that darker one. Do you guys see how that works? Okay. If I move over here to the next one, this is a triad or a split complementary. I have a primary color that I'm picking. And it's splitting the complement. So instead of going straight across to the complement, so if I was in yellow, for example, instead of going straight across and getting blue as a complement, I get a different shade of blue and kind of a darker purple. So it's splitting the complement. So I can move around and I could pick uh, whatever color that I liked. And then I get uh, my split complement. Again, this is the same as that in this case. So I'm really getting 15 different swatches. If I move on to the tetrad, <coughs> these are essentially two analogous colors and their complements. So here I have my, my primary. I get an analogous color to the primary. Then I get the complement to the, sorry, I get the complement to the primary and the complement to the analogous color. And in that case, I'm getting 20. So these two are complements of each other, and these two are complements of each other. 
these two are analogous to each other, and these two are analogous to each other. And then the last option here is basically freestyle, and you can do whatever you want with it. Um, I would encourage you to use one of these uh, presets, and it's really up to you as to what you pick. Uh, being aware that you're going to get on this first one, you're going to get five color swatches out of it. These next several, these two, there and there, you're going to get 15 out of it. This one, you're going to get 20 color swatches out of it. So those are the numbers that you're going to end up with. So I'll use the split complementary, and I'll pick, um, I'll pick that as my color. Remember that I can adjust how dark or light the, uh, the colors are, the adjacent colors there. Okay, so once I have this set up, I'm going to go up to the, sorry, go down to the tables and export little link. And so when I get this tables and export link, it gives me my primary color, and it gives me a hex value for those colors. It gives me an RGB value for those colors as well. So it would be really annoying to have to flip the page over and to write down, oh, I want to repeat this. It's going to be an RGB of 255, 234, 124. And this one's going to be 213, 193, and 87. I could do it. I could go into Illustrator. Um, let me create a new document here just so that I can illustrate this. You're not going to be doing this. I'm just showing you. I wanted my fill color here to be, okay, let's say it was this purple, 116, 62, and 142. So I'd come over here to the R, G, and B values, and it was 116, 42, is that what it was? 116, 62, and 142. 62, and 142, and that gives me that purple value. It's really annoying to have to do that. I could enter the hex key down here, too, under the little hashtag sign. That would get me to the same color. And I'll say, okay, and now my, my uh, rectangle here is the same color as that color on the website. So I could certainly do it this way, but it's really challenging. So instead, I'm going to look down here, and I can click on the color swatches little button, and I can save it. These are my choices, a PNG image, an ACO or Photoshop file, a GPL, which is a GIMP file, or a sketch palette. So the only one that's in the Adobe product line is the Photoshop file. So I'll go ahead and download that version. And it's going to save a mypalette.aco into your downloads folder. That's what it created. So let's take a look at that in Photoshop. So I'm going to open up Photoshop. OK, and now I want to be able to see that color palette. I'm going to do that by going into the Edit menu and coming down to the Presets menu and choosing on the Preset Manager. When I bring up the Preset Manager, it has several different types of presets. I'm not looking for brushes. I'm looking for swatches. It's the second one down. These are the swatches that are loaded by default into Photoshop. I want to bring in that new set of swatches. So pay attention to where you ended. So I ended on this kind of red color because it's going to add from there going forward. I'm going to click on the Load button. And I'm going to go into my downloads folder and choose that mypalette.aco file, the one I just downloaded. And I'll go ahead and say load. So starting right here, it loaded all of those colors for me. So I didn't have to type in any color values. It just saved that information, and now I, I have those. These are perfectly usable in Photoshop if I opened up the swatches label. The truth is, I would rather have them in Illustrator or InDesign. They're more useful to me there. So I now need to save this into a file that can go to those other programs. So let me click on the first one, and it kind of highlights in that light blue color. I'll hold down Shift, and I'll click on the last one. So I've now selected this whole row. That's the group of swatches that I just brought in, the 15 that I brought in. It would seem logical that you'd click on the Save Set button. Unfortunately, this only saves the Photoshop 
set again, which I already have. So instead, I'm going to click this little gear icon here with the downward facing arrow. And I'm going to choose to save swatches for exchange. This then will create uh, an Adobe Swatch Exchange file, an ASE file, which can be read by Photoshop, InDesign, and Illustrator. It's universal across all the programs. So this is the ideal file type. It would have been really nice if the Palatine website had just given us this kind, because then you could open it and load it in, in any of the Adobe products. So I'm going to go ahead and click this Save Swatches for Exchange. And I'm going to save that into today's folder on my computer. So let's see here. Oh, by the way, um, I saw when I was doing the grading, I noticed that several of you posted last class's exercise as exercise 115 instead of exercise 114. I skipped a day of class because of being sick. I condensed two days together into uh, 113. And so as we go forward, we're one day ahead of the lectures from last class. So you're, the numbers are going to be a little bit off from here out. So just trust what it says on your handout. It, we are in 115. That's the one that you post today. Uh, anyway, I found them all. You shouldn't, get, you shouldn't have missed uh, credit for it. If you, if you posted it and said 115, I just put your credit into 114. I'm just telling you that going forward. So anyway, we are in 115 today. And I'm going to call this the Palatin uh, swatches. And I'll go ahead and click Save. Notice that it's in a swatches, a .ase file, which is what I want. Perfect. So I've now saved those swatches, and I can load them into any of the Adobe products. So what I'm going to ask you to do in Illustrator is to be able to load them into Illustrator. But to save you a little bit of time, if you go to our exercise 115 for today, I have a list of swatch sample files based on how many colors you've chosen. So in my case, I have 15 colors. I'm going to download the 15 color swatch file. I'll just click on it, and it will download. And then I can click on it, and it will open. Essentially, what I did is I created a bunch of squares that we can then apply the swatches to. This top row got grouped together before I saved. I forgot to ungroup it. Um, so you might have to right click and say ungroup which will allow you access to all the individual little rectangles. So we're going to take that set of swatches that I just saved. We're going to bring it into Illustrator, and we're going to apply that set onto each one of these squares. So let me show you how that works. In Illustrator, I'm going to go to the Swatches panel. You would go to Window and choose Swatches. There it is. Or it's also available if you're in the Essentials workspace. It's the third icon down. It looks like a bunch of little squares. And we see in this swatches that there are a bunch of swatches that have been loaded in already. These are the default Illustrator swatches that come in. I want to bring in my set of swatches. I'm going to do that by clicking the flyout menu, the triangle with the four lines next to it. And at the bottom, I'll say Open Swatch Library, Other Library. So you see there's actually a bunch of swatches that are already listed here um, that you can use. We're going to go into Other Library, and I'm going to go into my folder for today where I just saved that Swatch Exchange file. There it is. There's my Palatin Swatches. And I'll go ahead and say Open. And it brings up the Swatch Exchange in its own little window here with all of my little colors. Now, to apply these, it's really easy. I select the first object, click on the swatch. It's now that color. I select the second object, second swatch. Third object, third swatch. Fourth object, fourth swatch, etc. <coughs> Moving down, I'll move into the purples. There. And then I'll move into the blues. And there we go. I've got them all. So there are all of my swatches. I've created them. I've proven that I'm capable of loading them into uh, Illustrator. So at this point, I need to save my work and post this. I'm going to post this as my featured image. And I'll also upload my swatch exchange file, my ASE file, to go with it. 
As we move forward, I'm going to show you a couple other websites that you can pick from. This was my first example. And should you want to go through and play around with a few of the other ones, uh, I would encourage you to do it. I suggest um, under part three, picking a different website. Uh, that website is colored.com, which is this website. Um, th what they do is they, they pull out color swatches from images for the most part. So if you found an image that you liked, you could upload that image and get a selection of colors based on that image. Yeah. And it's like doing the little wheel thing? OK, so I was just about to get to that. The colored does not like Chrome, unfortunately. So as much as I hate to say it, Internet Explorer is our best option here, which is awful, I know. But if you go to colored uh, and you go to create, you can choose this image DNA option. And when you click on that, let me go back to just the basic colored website here for a second. This is where I just was. It is in Internet Explorer. I know it's awful, but we just have to deal with it. Um, and up here at the top, if you click the Create button, you can then go to the image DNA. And there it is. And so they have a variety of images that you can, you can just pick from, but you can also open your own. So here, if I click on Open, here's a bunch of images that people have uploaded. You could pick one of those images, and it would create the color palette based on those images. It's a pretty cool system, really. If you wanted to upload your own, you could click on Upload, Choose Image, and you could pick one uh, you know, off your flash drive. So if you had one from way back when we did the, um, the photographs, you know, let's say I had that one. I could open it, and then it's going to give me my color palette based on that particular image. So it's kind of, kind of an interesting way of coming up with the color palette. Uh, so once you're done, you can click on Save. It's going to allow you to do Illustrator, Photoshop, or the GIMP file. We'll go ahead and save the file. Save it as. And let me put it into today's folder. Save. And the advantage here is that it's straight into the Illustrator file. So I could open it directly in Illustrator. Uh, this was a five, a group of five colors. So let me come back to the digital tool site. Let me get my five color sample. There it is. And I'll go ahead and load those color swatches. So I'll go up to the flyout menu. I'll go down to open swatch library, other library. And now I have to go back to my flash drive into today's folder. And there it is. And there's my colors. So same thing. I click and apply the colors. like that. Okay, so it's just another way of, of, of getting uh, color palettes. Uh, the, let's see, there's another website. We just did colored. The Color Trends website gives you more just basic information. It doesn't have a, a way of picking colors. Um, I did a, uh, another search here. This is galactic.inc slash sphere. Um, and they have a similar setup here where you can choose which uh, color model you want to follow. So in this case, it was a split complementary. You pick one color and you get, you know, you have your primary and then you get your two split complementary colors. Uh, and I believe you can save this into Illustrator or Photoshop from this particular website. So there's a lot of these websites out there uh, to help you decide which colors to pick. OK, um, so I think that covers pretty much everything. I do want to introduce you to one other Illustrator feature uh, which we're going to go over in a lot more detail uh, next class. But since we have break, this is in a schedule where I didn't want break to happen. Um, question? Later. OK. Um, I, you know, we're, we're off, so I wanted to do this before break, but I'm not going to get there. So I'm going to show you just a little bit that's going to help you with your Charlie Harper. Um, if you finish with these swatches, which I imagine you will rather quickly, Use the rest of the time today to start working on your Charlie Harper and start drawing it. Uh, frequently with the Charlie Harper, people find that they want to 
uh, be able to fill in uh, various regions of your file. So let's say, for example, um, let me, I have to draw a few things, so bear with me for a second. I'm not pretending that this is the most attractive thing in the world, okay? So just bear with me. Oops. I know, not attractive, right? However, let's say that I've created this shape and I want to be able to fill in some of these regions with a particular color. All right, let me, let me add a couple more things um, behind. Okay, so I want to be able to fill in these various regions. It would be easy on the box, for example, to go ahead and, and pick something and fill it in with a particular color. You know, I could fill it in with some color and that's fine. But what if I want these individual pieces in here to be a different color? So in that case, what I need to do is I need to be able to use a tool called the Live Paint tool. And it's available underneath the Shape Builder tool. It looks like a Live Paint bucket. It's kind of like the Photoshop paint bucket tool. It's hidden underneath there. I'm going to use that, but before I can actually pick the tool, I need to select all of the objects. And so when you do a live paint, a couple suggestions to make it better. You don't have to do this, but it's not a bad idea to duplicate your layer before you do the live paint. So I'm going to go over to the layers here. I'm going to duplicate my layer, duplicate layer one, and I'll call this one live paint one. And the advantage here is if I mess something up, I still have my original drawing. So I'll turn off the original drawing, and I'm going to work on just the live paint layer. I'll select everything in my object. I'm going to go up to the object menu, go to live paint, and then make. And when I click that, my selection changes. It has these little stars in the corner. And I can now go to the live paint bucket tool, pick my color. I could even pick one of my swatch colors. And when I move over the object and I move inside of a particular region, I can actually click and paint that region this color. So I could go through and I could paint these in that color. I could change my color to a different color and I could paint that. Notice, however, that like this here, isn't contained by curves, so I can't paint outside of this. So I couldn't paint in between these lines. I'm limited to just inside. So I could switch and I could paint that. I could get a greenish color. It's not a particularly attractive green color and I could paint that in. Like that. Actually, I think it was supposed to be blue there. You get the idea. So when I'm done with that live paint group, I don't have to do anything more. If I want to manipulate the objects again, I'll click this expand button. And when I do that, it actually creates shapes that I can select with the direct select tool. So I could take any one of these. Oops. There you go. And I can manipulate any one of those shapes. So not necessary that you, you have to manipulate it. We'll talk more about that next class. But I wanted to at least introduce the concept of live paint because frequently with Charlie Harper, you do a drawing, and then you want to be able to paint it in. Paisley, do you have a question? Are we still the only one that's 
you can. The, the purpose of this is to, to show your prowess in, in Illustrator. Um, so I have an expectation that a lot of it will be in Illustrator. If you need some effects, you need something, you know, the background you need a little bit, by all means, you can do that. Um, and so I don't, I don't mind that you do it and kind of combine them. Um, but don't do the whole thing in Photoshop and then draw one line in Illustrator. You're missing the point of it. Make sense? OK, so I know that the, 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 this live paint was a little bit premature because we're going to get to that next class. But I know that you guys are going to be thinking about Charlie Harper and, and worrying about it. So I wanted to introduce that as a concept um, for helping fill in the various regions. OK, so today, original post with Charlie Harper, at least one post with swatches to prove that you understand what swatches are and that you can create the swatches. And then go ahead and start working on Charlie Harper. You don't need to post your work for Charlie Harper. So you make your post of this is what I'm going to base it on, but nothing else. Uh, you make one or more swatch posts. You do not need to comment on anything for this exercise. You're exempt from comments. Happy spring break, right? <laughs> so no comments necessary. I'm going to come around with your grade sheets in a little bit. Probably I'll answer a few questions, and then I'll come around with your grade sheets. Don't let me forget to give them to you today because I want you to have them, okay? <laughs>